sorry, wir sind an der noch vorbei. Hi. Ach so. Ah, das Good morning, everyone. Um, we're still uh, gathering together um, the full panel, but I thought, bearing in mind, we've been truncated to 30 minutes. <laughs> we better start before we, we spend our time um, uh, uh, just waiting around for people. Um, First of all, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. My name is uh, John Denton. I'm uh, the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris. Uh, we are the institutional voice of 45 million businesses globally. Uh, we set norms and standards, and we're also capable of governing areas of the economy because we have our own courts of arbitration. So we're an independent, purpose-led organization. Our purpose is to enable business worldwide to secure peace, prosperity, and opportunity for all. And when we talk about the enabling side of that, from our perspective, we see the internet uh, properly governed as being an enabler, but it must be able to satisfy the needs of civil society and the business, a business community and citizens more broadly, and be inclusive and ensure that like the ICC, which represents world business, not just Northern Hemisphere business, but also Southern, uh, Southern Hemisphere, uh, developing and developed countries, big companies and small companies, that if the internet is not governed in that way, then frankly, um, what are we all doing here? And what Joe Kaiser talked about, the sort of decoupling, well, yeah, well, I mean, that's going to happen, isn't it? So our aim is to ensure, uh, uh, the historically, the free flow of goods. We've been focused on the free flow of services, and now we're focused on the free flow of data, and that's part of the, the, the challenges of the ICC. But from us, uh, the issue of free flow of data must actually protect citizens' rights in terms of privacy and must also enable the internet itself to be protected on appropriate security and cyber security issues as well. And in that context, in our 100th year, we've just launched, well, I launched last night, a campaign to make technology work for all. And it won't work for all unless we've got appropriate uh, uh, governance over the issue of data and we get the balance right between uh, uh, sovereignty uh, and, uh, and uh, the interests of, uh, of uh, those participants in the uh, internet. By the way, one thing I did notice in the previous uh, sort of plenary is that one voice that's not represented anywhere here, though hopefully will be, is a third of the users of the internet are actually under the age of 18. And where are they? I mean, hello. <laughs> but it is actually kind of alarming that here we all sit around, and yet one of the great user groups, which is actually youth, is not appropriately represented in this discussion. So, uh, though, of course, uh, Minister Mamanoff, I'm sure you'll be able to, to pick that up. Um, as I said, the, um, we were trying to pull together the panel. We're not all here. So rather than waiting for Wolf uh, Hisserich, why don't we kick off? And if I can turn to you first, jo Jonathan, to make some comments about how you see all these interrelationships. And then look, Freak, we've only got half an hour. I'll do my best. I'll try and open up end of questions, and I'm sure someone will tell me I've been rude. But uh, by the way, I'm an Australian, so I get away with most things. So over to you, Joe. Great. Th thanks, John, and thanks, uh, thanks to everyone. It's a real uh, pleasure and honor to be here in, in Berlin. Um, ITI, my organization, represents 70 of the world's most innovative companies. We, we have our largest presence in Washington, DC. We also have an office in Brussels. We do work around the world. Um, it, it strikes me that the, the, the motto of the IGF this year, One World, One Net, One Vision, is particularly appropriate for the topic that we are going to discuss, uh, and in particular, the, the notion of sovereignty, which is a, a really important term. It's being used a lot, uh, and it reflects what I think is a very legitimate, challenging question that actually came up in our, uh, the opening speeches that we just saw concerning how to reconcile very legitimate uh, national considerations, national values, values and preferences that occur at the, the regional or local level with what is ultimately a global endeavor and a global imperative. I think it's, it's almost cliche now uh, to, to talk about the ways in which the internet depends on an open global system and approach to succeed and to d deliver all of the benefits of standards of living and growth and, and innovation to the world. Tackling the very legitimate public policy challenges uh, of which there is none more important than, than how to resolve issues around data rights 
is similarly global. And so uh, the, the, the idea that I wanted to leave with the few minutes that I have is just to, to implore people regardless of nationality, regardless of position, whether you're with industry, with government, with civil society, or otherwise, uh, not to sublimate, not to avoid the national preferences. Those are important. They're incredibly valuable. They, are, they make us, in many ways, who we are. But to recognize that the challenges we face ultimately are global in character, uh, we can only truly overcome them by viewing them at that level. And uh, with that kind of a mindset, I think we're best positioned to succeed. So thank you, John. I'll, I'll yield the balance of my time to the rest uh, of the panel. There you are. We're kind of working like a, an egg timer here. Um, we've got the pleasure of having Minister Mamontov uh, with us uh, uh, as a user of Telegram. Uh, I would actually like to know how you see uh, enabling policy environments being formed to actually make all this happen so the Russian experience would, experience would be very useful for us. Okay. So although you uh, urged me to speak on behalf of the youth, uh, I would rather say that Russia exercises rather a conservative approach to data management in many aspects, and there are reasons for that. I will just maybe uh, dwell on it some in my speaking points. So uh, when we speak about the trusted, trusted realm of our cyberspace, if I can put it this way, of our information space, we have three different blocks here. These are trusted networks, trusted data, and trusted uh, infrastructure. So you cannot have trusted data unless the other two elements are in place. So in, to ensure the trustworthiness of data in our world is really, really a challenging issue because it's related to some other issues that have nothing to do with data per se. Although what we now see is that, uh, well, in a data-centric economy, we, Russia as a small market, even if united with the Eurasian Union market, in terms of data, it's a small market, so we cannot foster our AI without developing norms and principles of exchange of data and other big data information with our, first of all, European partners. And for us, uh, identifying the unified norms of data exchange, at least uh, on, the pro on the content of Eurasia, is of paramount importance. Uh, at the same time, what we can now see uh, is uh, the necessity, well, I'll just uh, maybe sidestep a bit and speak on another point that I want to highlight here, maybe leaving more time for Q&A later. Uh, we in Russia do not really control or uh, somehow register fake news per se, although we do acknowledge the problem of that because lots of individuals, corporations, or political entities, for those of, I don't know, commercial or political gains, seek to disseminate information that is at best not qualified or at worst is called, can be called fake news. So this is a huge problem that we're now trying to deal with, and this again needs to be dealt globally. I don't personally believe in registers, when we will just label some companies, some, I don't know, media agencies, some individuals as fake news providers. We need to be more nuanced here. Because nuance is, a, is everything about the digital economy. In Russia, we are now developing the national data management system to increase trust towards data within the society. It's a, a basically a nation-based nation nation -based endeavor. Its main idea is to stipulate the principles on which the depersonalized data will be available to businesses and the society, thus ensuring smoother provision of civil services and bigger gains for Russian local businesses. And we, of course, are ready to work here with the international community to improve our national data management system. Unfortunately, we cannot be speaking about the exposure to best practices in this sphere. We don't have any best practices so far. The, one of the hugest challenges with the digital economy is that the phenomena that arise every day do not receive proper legal codification within the necessary time frame. So this is one of the challenges. It's, it has a very objective nature. I don't know what to do about it. Um, so basically, I think I have already abused my time. Uh, my, my speech was somewhat hectic, but when you speak about data, it's like everything. So it's really hard to encompass everything in just one speech. 
Okay, I'll cut myself here. But your schnick, was you did extremely well, Minister. Very good. Um, of course, we're out of order. Uh, I'd now like to flick back to the beginning, so it's a bit like a, a bit like a, a, a piece of modern art here. You just make sense of it yourself. Wolf Hesserich is with us, um, and I'm going to ask you to make some comments. I mean, it's all well and good to talk about the power of the internet and the power of interconnectedness, but the reality is, what, what if civil society, what if citizens don't have trust in it? And we already know that there's a huge issue with declining levels of trust in most institutions. How do we ensure that consumers and civil society and citizens have trust in the internet and the interconnectedness we're all arguing the case for? Okay. Thank you for having me. Um, I prepared a short presentation, but I'm pretty sure you're going to see so many today, so we just skip it. I present Quant, uh, which is a European search engine. It's a French tech company, um, and I'm in charge in Germany for the expansion also internationally. Um, coming to your, there's a presentation. Um, you want me to click, I, I talk about it a bit. I think it's a, are you fine with that if I talk about it, or you want me to show the presentation? Um, shall I hijack the time? Okay, so very quickly. Um, hmm. Not good, huh? <laughs> I need to talk about it, come on. Um, so it's a search engine. Um, we just talked about Russia. Um, I know Akali Volosh quite well. He's the founder and CEO of, of Yandex, which is a Russian search engine. For the ones who are not so familiar with search engine, uh, we are living in the worlds of Google. Um, which is a de facto monopoly in, in many areas. Why is it so important to have choice? Yeah? You go to a supermarket, you go to French hypermarché, you have choices like crazy. Just with entering the internet, we always take the same door. Um, talking about trust, a lot of people have a lot of question marks regarding today's uh, management of data. Uh, we are not uh, tracking and tracing. I think this is important. And uh, like I said, with Yandex, you see very good examples of diversifying. Uh, Yandex now is a very strong shopping uh, portal, and you see their taxes in not only in Russia, you see them in Istanbul, you see them in Tel Aviv. Uh, so there you see a little bit of a, of a development. Um, we, as Quant, strongly believe in data security, data privacy. Um, search engines, by the way, are not so only important for, for us as users, as customers, but you can also use them for the government, the industry. Think about a search engine of objects, yeah, and the next level of the internet, uh, web or industry 4.0. Why doesn't IoT work like it should today? Because there's a big lack of trust, yeah, and if you, if you are able to match this, if you are able to find from a European point of view also a strong counterbalance to what you see out there where the winner takes it all. Um, we truly believe from Quant and from a European perspective um, that um, it is highly important in the, um, on the topic of European digital sovereignty, which maybe two years back has been sounded as a lame joke and now it's something quite different. Um, that is a bit where, where we see our role. Thanks, Wolf. And I think uh, hopefully we'll have time for some questions. So we've heard about um, the concepts of trust there and data sovereignty, and uh, the, the potential continues to be argued for in terms of the interconnectedness and what it unleashes. But how do we balance this, Sonia, with uh, the rights of consumers? Who's going to talk about that? You can talk about consumers? And talk. <laughs> well, in my notes it says, direct the question to you to talk about consumers, so I'm only doing what I'm told. <laughs> sure, I can uh, talk about uh, consumers. Um, when we um, are talking about consumers, we're also talking about um, uh, data ownership. And if you have a look at, um, at the moment, you, you see um, two different um, opponent uh, groups um, when it uh, comes to, to, to this uh, topic, the first group, they say, well, um, data are very, very individual. They, they are supposed to be private. And um, the individual who generates the data should own those data. Well, on the other hand, you, you have a group that comes from the view of society. They say, well, um, 
you can um, you you can benefit a lot if you link different kind of uh, data sets together. You you can find out patterns and, for example, um, um, use these patterns to to heal certain diseases. So um, that um, uh, for, for this reason, data. Um, 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 yeah, uh, can be or, sh or should be used, for example, by by startups, by small companies, um, for the ben benefit of um, all um, of us. I do not really think that there's a contradiction in both uh, views, because there's the opportunity to make data anonymous. Yeah, you can general, generalize data in a way that all the different relationships between the data are um, saved. Um, but you cut off a certain string of those data that leads down to an individual person. And um, so if you cut off the string, the uh, data sets are still very, very valuable. They contain a lot of information. You can create a lot of different business models out of it. And um, it is not necessary to make money with data through a surveillance capitalism only. There are a lot of other opportunities out there. So. We believe, I um, um, was uh, also, I have founded my own startup um, several years ago, and I was for several years a um, board member of the German Startup Association, and we do think that you can make a lot of money with the data without um, harming the privacy of the individual. For sure, this also um, de depends a little bit uh, where, where you grew up, where you're coming from. I uh, grew up in, a, in the liberal world, and I strongly believe that um, that uh, I should have a, a free will and that I should decide um, freely um, the way that I spend my money, for example. And um, just to, to make it a little bit uh, more, more specific, what if you do not cut these strings from data um, down to the individual, um, what happens nowadays is that all of those um, strings, they are used to build a very, very close network. Yeah, a, a net through the individual person. So we cannot really decide uh, free. We are controlled, we are manipulated. The internet that I see, that I have access to, is a different one that you see, yeah, or you. Um, it's, uh, it totally differs. So um, let us cut by regulation. This is um, what, uh, what I claim, um, these strings. Let the people decide when they want to share the, the individualism um, in, in order to, to get a recommendation for a restaurant or whatever. Um, but nevertheless, let us use all the information within data sets in order to create new business, to, to help the society to further um, progress. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. Sigrid, did you want to offer some perspectives at this point? Thank you. So what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm slightly different from all the others because I'm the chairwoman of the BVG. Uh, the BVG is located here in Berlin and it's Germany's biggest public transport company here in Berlin. Uh, we operate all these yellow subways, trams and buses in the city 24 hours, 7 days a week. Over 1 billion passengers per year uh, use our services. And perhaps you can imagine we generate really millions of data every day, every hour. Traffic data, vehicle data, customer data, personal data. And of course, we use these data to improve our services. 
Uh, but data is not only vital for our company, it is the, the key to a more sustainable city of Berlin. Uh, we use this data to develop our transport services and also to connect different mobility services in the city. Uh, in our app, for example, customers can compare, book and pay several mobility services, such as public transport, taxi, ride pooling, bike and also car sharing. Our aim in Berlin is with this data to reduce traffic and to foster shared mobility. Uh, with this data, we can really help to improve the customer's journey here in Berlin. And why I'm saying we are different? The BVG is a public company. Uh, we serve as a public cause. Therefore, the data we generate belongs to everyone. It's a common good. But this often leads to a false assumption. So the assumption is sometimes that we must make our data public to everybody and to everyone. For example, to start up enterprises uh, which develop new mobility platforms as well as multinational companies. People expect us to give away our data for a public course for free. We believe the opposite is true. Because we are a public company, we have a particular responsibility for this data. We guarantee for a responsible use of this data without any intention of commercial profit. We are bound to strict data production. We are bound to strict data protection regulations. Customer will only use our services and give us uh, their data when they know that the data is really safe in the BVG. You always saw this uh, saying, um, data is a new oil. Nobody would expect a state-owned oil company to give away their oil for free as a present for everyone. And it's the same with data. In our opinion, politics must watch out that data is not concentrated in the hands of a few multinationals and instead strive for a common benefit. I think this common benefit is very important. So, should public companies uh, give away their data? Of course, if it's for the reason of uh, making a better city and not the reason to earn money. So public data is very important and I think it's, it's really uh, great when other companies use this public data on a non-profit basis. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Sigrid. I mean, one of the interesting observations just from the data itself is that um, when a lot of publicly available data has actually been put out there, and you've actually seen SMEs and you've seen different startups seek, seek to use that, what's interesting is that the at the commencement there's actually been quite a good dispersity, dis, disparity, I mean, diver, diversity in the users, but over a relatively quick period of time. Uh, certain entities start emerging and actually start reflecting and behaving in a way which resembles mono monopolistic behaviours. So this combination of competition law and actually data is going to be very important as well. One thing I like about the Internet Governance Forum, it actually brings together lots of different voices and I hope with the debates that go on this week that won't be lost when we're actually thinking about the next generation of the Internet uh, Governance Forum. But one of the key voices that needs to be heard is actually the operators. I mean, we're talking about all these new kind of frameworks. Uh, how does that going to impact the way the operators actually play? Thank, thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Duncan McIntosh. I'm with the APNIC uh, Foundation, um, which is the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. So I'm bringing the perspective from Asia, but as John mentioned, also operators. 
For those who know the internet registries like APNIC, we provide the IP addresses, the IP address resources that every network operator around the world needs to connect everybody's device. So everyone in this room, if you go to your settings, look in there, you'll find your IP address that you've been provided by your provider on a daily basis dynamically. And that's managed by five numbers registries around the world, of which APNIC is one. And we're a membership, non-profit organisation. That was the model that when the internet started, they would decided all the registries, the five registries should be. And as such, um, as a non-profit membership organisation, we have around 16,000 direct and indirect members in the Asia Pacific. Our region is 56 economies. So we range from the world's largest mobile phone operator in China to, I, I would estimate, is the smallest ISP in the Pacific Island economies. Um, so a very diverse membership. And what they bring to this debate and discussion around data rights is an understanding of the network operator and the technical community, that they have a very important role to play. They're the ones literally transmitting the data. And they expect and want to participate in forums like this um, through APNIC um, and, their, and their own entities to say that as you think about data rights and, and want to develop policy and regulation around data rights, you think about the impact of that policy and regulation on the actual network providers themselves. Because one of the implications of new policy and regulation around data for network operators is inevitably increased cost. Um, and that cost flows on to the users. So as you develop policy uh, and regulation around data rights, think carefully about the impact of that. Will it make the networks more efficient? Obviously, it's a really important area and we want to bring in uh, better governance for these issues, but also the, the impact of that ultimately on the users because uh, increased regulation or regulation that's uh, not thought through, particularly in the context um, uh, what we would be concerned about is we're very committed to a global, open and stable and secure internet for everybody. And regulation can cause fragmentation is just one example of the issues. And it's for that reason we really value um, the IGF and, and we look to the IGF as a forum that we can participate in. We really encourage everybody to engage here because this is the place where we can see the true multi-stakeholder community of which we are just one member can come together and discuss these type of issues. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, Philip, um, we'll turn to you now. I mean, Switzerland's played a very important role in the IGF. Um, and of course, one of the issues that your organisation grapples with in Switzerland is this, well, I would say there's a tension between the protecting the, the personal data of individuals and unleashing the economic opportunities of the internet. Okay, so let's acknowledge there is a tension there. Uh, one of the dangers is that there'll be a trade-off and the trade-off will emerge, which will actually diminish the rights of individuals, because that's often the way uh, I think um, a lot of these global discussions occur, but there is actually a very strong uh, requirement for balance here. So how is, the, how is Switzerland grappling with this issue? And what, do you, what recommendations do you have for us? Thank you very much. Well, I, I think it's maybe a bit early to give the global community a recommendation, you know, from a, from one small country. But uh, as you said, we're as, as as Switzerland and also as the Federal Office of Communications that I'm representing here, which is part of the of the government structure. Um, of course, we we see um, the the entire process and the debate around data, both at the national level but also at the international level. And I think it was very inspiring, certainly to me, what we heard this morning from Joe Kaiser from a corporate uh, perspective. I think many things um, that he said are certainly uh, very dear to us, you know, when it comes to the question of transparency and the question of um, how the, um, the actors are enabled to, to use their data, uh, and which is probably also a good example why we have no other choice than, you know, discussing and, and dealing with this at the, um, at the global level and in a multi-stakeholder setting, because this is not something that just one actor can I can determine. And right now, if you look at our uh, discussion in Switzerland, uh, of course, the protection is a key, a key issue. I think there is a lot of, of, of stuff going on. There's legislation going on when it comes to modernizing data protection. Um, there is, of course, um, uh, legislation going on when it comes to electronic identification, for instance. I think the e-identity is a key aspect also in the digital world. And when it comes to data, um, there are other um, efforts um, by the, the public uh, policy decision makers 
uh, to address transparency issues. And maybe to pick uh, you up on one thing you mentioned, the youth, uh, initially the youngsters that are maybe not so much represented here and today, at least we can't see it in the, in the, in the gleaming light, but uh, we, had a, we had a national conference um, back in September in Switzerland, uh, which is a regular thing we do, multi-stakeholder conference about uh, assessing where Switzerland as a country is heading in terms of digital development and what of kind of framework conditions we should have. Um, so of course this involves everyone. It's truly multi-stakeholder and we, we, we put a particular emphasis there on how the young um, people see this in our country. And what was quite striking is when it comes to data um, that they really uh, were quite open to their data being used for a good purpose or for their own benefit, but they were equally clear that transparency uh, on the one hand was key for them. They wanted to know where their data was going, what was happening with the data for those who collect those data. And secondly, they wanted to have a say in how the data can be used. Um, even if it's just transparent, that's not good enough. And so I think if we look at that tension that you were underlying, protection on the one hand and, and, and then on the other hand, how can we use data? I think uh, right now, agency is a key um, agency is a key discussion point for us. How can we enable stakeholders, citizens, individuals to have agency when it comes to their own data and determine in a given setting, in a concrete application, how they want to use it or how they want it to be used? If I take mobility as an example, we have a colleague here from, from the public transport. I mean, we are now having a, a quite a, a concrete discussion, including academia, including startups, including um, civil society, and of course the transport sector, both private and public, on how um, there could be applications, there could be digital tools um, that allow the individual to determine how he wants its mobility data to be put into the system, to be used, and what kind of benefit it could get, I mean, they could get as individuals, but of course also what they think is, is important in a public, from a public perspective as a society, what data could be used for mobility. So this is a very concrete example where I think it boils down to the question of what agency um, can we give and what form does it take? Because it takes a lot of different technical um, uh, tools. I mean, there are many options. Uh, there are different ways also of, of um, analyzing data, as you mentioned, maybe without reaching um, the, the privacy or, or the anonymity. There are homo homomorphic computing methods and so on, which will allow to protect um, the data. But right now, I think from our perspective, um, it is key that we develop, we go further to be concrete in terms of what the individual can actually do with, with this data. Thanks very much. Now, look, um, I have no idea uh, how much more time I have, but I'm working on the basis that uh, I've got another 10 minutes. We'll seize the, the 10 minutes. Uh, why don't I open this, uh, the discussion up to uh, particip participation from the audience? So if you go, here we go, straight away into it. Uh, the gentleman at the very front with the blue uh, sweater on, uh, who's standing up now, would you give, give the man a microphone? Oh, and can you also say who you are? <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, my name is Matthias. I work with uh, a new governance organization. We work closely, closely with uh, My Data Global organization. We've united uh, 100 organizations around the globe to define together governance model for the free flow of personal data that is truly human-centric. So we work also closely with uh, the European Commission to kind of set this in stone and define open standards for everybody uh, to reuse not only technical standards but legal standards, business model standards as well. And uh, my question is more of a, of a thought. Uh, in uh, ensuring this uh, trust issue and making sure that uh, everybody benefits from this free flow of data, there is a, a principle that we're kind of testing and proposing is a separation of powers principle. Uh, what if we say strongly that the organizations that uh, store and process data are not the same ones that uh, handle the authorizations and the rights of people on their data. This has uh, several advantages. Uh, first one being that we won't depend on one single platform that will say, okay, give me all your data and I will manage everything and your authorizations. Secondly, is that uh, the, it will be truly human-centric. Only rights have to be kind of centralized and all data 
data can be stored and managed where it is. And thirdly, uh, that uh, it's truly an open ecosystem where uh, data can uh, freely flow and people can really trust the rights because the organizations uh, handling the transparency and the rights don't touch the data and have no interest in handling the data. So the, the, my question is more to hear your thoughts, anybody, but more precisely uh, Sonia, Sigrid or John about this, uh, this principle and what it could bring uh, to, to trust and free flow of personal data. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I should have said we, before I started that there's no such thing as a good question or a bad question, but there is such a thing as a long question or a short question. So in order to make certain we get a lot of access, we move along. Sigurd or Sonia, do you want to quickly respond to that in terms of the governance issue and the separation of powers? Well, I, I do believe that separation of power is always a good um, thing. Yeah, and This is what history um, has taught us in many, many ways. Um, here it would really depend on how do you organize it, how do you structure it. If you um, store the data and only repurses them, how can you earn money with this and so on and so on. So I think, um, yes, we do need uh, a separation of power and, and, and um, th this is for sure. Yeah, I do not um, doubt this in uh, any way. And um, we need uh, regulation here to, to make sure that this will happen. Um, but the question then is how do we really perform it or execute it? We've got time for one more quick question and then um, I'll try to wrap it up so that we can move um, into the next session. There is, is there another question out there? Okay. Well, the one, oh, at the very back, please. Um, the man, please stand up, another man. Um, uh, is there a microphone or would you like to come forward and we can give you one from here? Thank you. Oh, there. We have a colleague. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, mine was, mine is actually quite easy. I watch movies and I watch the big hacks. My name's Willem Faber from South Africa. So I watched The Big Hack, and it was on an analytica company, etc. So for me, not being involved in computers so much, this was actually quite a scare. If you look at it, how people's data are being used. Um, how do you really keep people's data safe if they don't want their data out there, for instance, and the influence that it can have on politics as well? Um, you know, you look at this and you think that it's maybe just like a movie, but it's actually quite scary if you look at it, that people's data is not safe and how people can then actually be manipulated in making decisions. Thanks very much. By the way, I was going to ask um, uh, for you to actually respond to that question, but quickly, I was with the Prime Minister of Estonia the other day, and in Estonia, she was telling me they've actually made it a criminal offence the misuse of per personal data. And that does actually kind of exercise the mind about that. But I'm just wondering, what's the Swiss experience on this? Well, I think ultimately it boils down to good governance. So how are the actors um, that are dealing with data behaving and what kind of um, uh, respect for, for, the, for, for the, the legal positions of the individuals do they have? Because we clearly see in the marketplace very different uh, behaviors. Some are clearly... Uh, reprehensible, some are even criminal, and others are extremely um, uh, loyal to the customer, respecting uh, the data privacy. So I think it will depend very much on the environment within which uh, you operate, what kind of level of uh, degree of trust there is between the different actors, uh, uh, and then with, the, with regard to the question how much regulation has to be imposed, because of course if there is a very um, untidy uh, environment, you will have to uh, legislate, uh, regulate, and police much more strictly, whilst uh, when there is a, a sort of a, a climate of mutual respect, uh, generally speaking, and of good governance, um, I think it can be done with more light touch uh, approaches. So it will ultimately depend very much on the, um, on the environment within which you're operating uh, and on the philosophy uh, that is sort of the, the community co jointly can adhere to over time. Look, thanks very much. Why don't we, I really have to bring it to a close now. A couple of big ideas that have been running around uh, 
uh, what, as people worry about this issue of data, about the potential for uh, decoupling, but really a split, uh, is the creation of some kind of world data organization on the lines of the World Trade Organization, because it's not really working at the moment. And so there's some thought going on about that. The other is the establishment of a, uh, a, s a similar but different IPCC, which is, would actually be around this issue, bringing together almost like eminent persons globally to grapple with this issue. In a way, these are sort of ideas that I think the Internet Governance Forum should be thinking about as well, but how do we take the institutional arrangements, how do we actually create some form of um, global international institutions to support this. Uh, in the interim, uh, in organizations like mine, the ICC, uh, we're independent, we're uh, a not-for-profit, a for-purpose, we can actually govern various spaces. We're more than happy to utilize our good offices to support this, because ultimately we want to enable business worldwide to secure peace, prosperity and opportunity for all, and we don't want to see the internet broke down, break down. So it's in our interests and all your interests as well, I think. So thanks very much. I'm glad to be part of a gathering of 10,000 techie nerds in Berlin for a week. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.
Hello. Welcome, everybody. We will start with the panel either way, um, because we do not have much time left. So please take a seat. So welcome to the panel Safety and the Right to Protection. I think there are still two panelists missing, but we will start. Um, and actually, we have so many great people here who have uh, important messages to say. So I would like to start with you. Biban, please proceed. Uh, good morning. So uh, I am actually going to talk just about one user group. And I, for anyone who was in the last session, um, it was I, I was sitting next to John earlier, and I said to him, you know, there's a third of the people on the internet are under the age of 18. They're children. And they are not in this room, apart from the one that I brought, who is going to be on a panel later. Uh, so I am actually unabashedly just going to talk about uh, children, why we should consider them, how we should consider them, and if the clock isn't run down by then, maybe a little bit about what good looks like. Do you know, I'm also going to ask whoever's talking to stop talking. We are so few people. We should um, thank you. So, um, there are nearly one billion children online, and 170,000 come online every day. And the internet was not really imagined as a place where childhood would happen. So when there was, and Tim is here amongst us today, but when they, the founders had their utopian view of what good looked like, it was that all users would be equal. And the problem with that idea is that if all users are considered equal, then a child is treated as if they were an adult. And that is the fundamental reason that we have to have another think about the internet in relation to children. And rather than see them as victims of some extreme action, actually think more profoundly about whether it meets their needs. Because I would say there is a correlation between actually upholding their rights and actually them having a safe and secure and uh, a time online. So specifically, what I wanted to say is we all know as members of, as people who've been children or who have children or, or relate to children in different ways, that a child of four, of seven, of 12, of 17 have very different needs. So, for example, if you're three to five, yeah, you just beginning to understand that people see the world differently from you, but you have not one critical way of, uh, of understanding information and sorting that out critically. So you take what you're told as verbatim. It's not until a child is 13 or 15 that they even understand the concept of risk and even at that point, some run towards it, some run, run away from it. But this is my point, is we have to imagine that all of these kids, in all of their varying needs, are all using the technology designed for adults. So, the reason that we have made arrangements for children, and there is a global consensus about this in the offline world, is because they have these specific development needs, because they need specific privileges, because they need the handrails of life. And there is only one environment now that childhood plays out in which this is not operating, and that is the digital. So, this vast demographic, this one in three users who are being treated in an age appropriate, uh, an age inappropriate way now need us to flip the the dial and um, sorry I'm looking at my I'm looking at the boss over here so so really all I, I'm just going to say a few things so we have to first of all recognize they're there yeah we have to understand that a child is someone under the age of 18 we have to apply their rights and if you think about it if you if you think about it this way yeah if you took a 
an impact assessment on the digital on any digital service that you can imagine and say how does it affect their well-being how is it affecting their autonomy how is it affecting their health how is it affecting their sleep and you start to have a series of practical answers of how you could redesign the digital world in a way that would be for their benefit and i'm actually going to finish by saying three things first of all the normal response to this is we should teach children to adapt to the digital world. This will build resilience. Now, I am all for education, and I, use, uh, I work very closely with a lot of children. But you cannot ask a billion children to adapt to a system that is not designed to th for them. You must adapt the system for their best interest. Secondly, uh, it is not a binary between access and the system we have now. We have to design a system that is suitable. And lastly, this is not necessarily about age verification, and it's not about uh, content only. It's about the nudges and about the economic exploitation. It's about their data. It's about their digital identity. And I think that you have to look at this in the round. So. Thank you very much for that. So, Bertrand, when we talk about adapting systems, we oftentimes have national leg legislation versus transnational communication in the system. How would you add to that? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bertrand Lachapelle. I'm the executive director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Um, it's a very compact format, and the question that you ask is something that I could probably elaborate for about an hour and a half. So I will spare you the, uh, the time, and I want to focus on one, one key dimension, which is that, as it is particularly appropriate to say in uh, the IGF, there is no alternative to coordination between the different actors to address the challenges that we're facing. And this is extremely important because we are moving from a period of what could be called techno-euphoria, where everything was going to be marvelous because of technology, to a period of techno-doom, where we think that everything is going to be bad because of technology. Both are excessive, and the reality is that human nature has not changed. The problem is that as we grew more aware of the abuses, and there are abuses that have to be addressed, we are developing a flurry of initiatives with all the best intentions by public authorities, by private actors, by civil society. And those initiatives, in spite of their good intentions, are mostly uncoordinated. They are adopted on a reflexive uh, manner, they're reactive, they're quick fix, they are a little bit patchwork and I would say makeshift and this sort of, um, <laughs> I would say to use a French word, this sort of governance bricolage cannot be sustainable because fundamentally the lack of coordination is making the problems harder to solve. It increases the number of conflict of laws and we're in a situation where there's basically a sort of legal arms race that is threatening the very benefits of the, uh, of the internet itself. And so, we are focusing on the symptoms, the abuses, the fact that we have difficulties addressing those issues. But the deeper cause of the problem is that we do not have the instruments, we do not have the tools, we do not have the spaces for all the different stakeholders to be around the same table and address the challenges that they're confronted with. And so the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network in a report that we are releasing this week has highlighted, the Global Status Report, the enormous amount of initiatives that are taking place around the world in the legislative environment, in the um, private sector uh, activities. But it is also recording, and that was a very strong message that was sent by the third global conference that we had in Berlin in June uh, in partnership with the uh, German government that sent a very, very strong message of the need for legal interoperability. The only way to reconcile the need for the different actors to have the autonomy of their decision making and at the same time, the compatibility and the coexistence between the public authorities around the world and the private actors is to think in terms of 
legal interoperability and taking inspiration from the way the internet itself was developed. This is about the exercise of sovereignty in the digital age. Sovereignty is still relevant. However, it needs to be exercised in a different manner because in many cases, we need to have extraterritorial exercise of national sovereignty and the territorially based national jurisdictions are struggling when we're trying to organize the coexistence of billions of people in shared online spaces. So the core message is we need to build the mechanisms that allow all the different actors to address their problems in common and there's no alternative to coordination among those actors to improve legal interoperability. I think that's the one message that I would like to share today. Thank you very much. And we have a expert for building cyber capacity in, in the Pacific with us, um, Ambassador Fikin, and maybe he can add on how they tried or are currently building up coordination in the Indo-Pacific area. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity um, to be here. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we see in the Indo-Pacific and one of the things that we believe as uh, the Australian government is that um, for a start, we're only as strong as our, our weakest link. So it's important for our own um, interests of our population, of, of our national interests that we build capacity of others in our region. But what, what we see is a patchwork quilt in the Indo-Pacific of different capability levels, of um, different ability to be able to respond to the threat environment. Whoever the threat actor might be, wherever that threat comes from, we work with a whole range of different governments who uh, might be struggling with policy approaches to these particular issues, uh, might be struggling with practical approaches. Um, if I just think about the kinds of work that we do in terms of building capacity to combat cybercrime, whatever particular crime that might be, however it's being perpetrated in, in the online environment, um, we work with a whole range of governments so to look firstly at uh, what kind of legislation exists to be able to combat these crimes. How can we assist in, in building better legislative approaches within a country? Then how can you work with uh, legal fraternity in order that they understand the legislation or are able to prosecute against that legislation? Um, but also you need to work with the police forces in the region who um, often don't have great forensics capability in order that they can bring digital forensics into a court case in a submissible form. Um, and then also working with the judiciary itself in order that um, judges understand the severity of the crime in which they're actually prosecuting against. And then as um, we've just uh, spoken about earlier in the panel, how do you then begin to link all of those pieces up at, at the international level? Um, certainly something that, that we talk about a lot as Australia is the um, Budapest Convention, uh, the, the cybercrime legislation that links a whole range of different countries in the world in order that we can um, essentially access evidence far more quickly in order that we can gain um, evidence um, to put into a court system in an admissible form. And it's one of the few mechanisms we actually have for cooperation. Um, unfortunately, it does tend to get caught up in the whole kind of geopolitical discussion, which is a real shame because it's actually a really effective mechanism um, for coordinating. It's not easy, even as Australia, we went through an awful lot of shifts and um, difficulties in our own interdepartmental structures in order that we could introduce the Budapest Cybercrime Convention in 2013, um, but a really important mechanism. But then more broadly, we need to be working with civil society, um, ensuring the level of awareness of threats, again, wherever they might be, so that um, individuals can make the most of the opportunity um, that is out there. And that really requires that we're not just working as governments, talking about what governments are interested in, because I think most members of the public tend to switch off when it's a government talking to them. So we work really hard in building partnerships with various NGOs, with private sector entities, uh, with academia, in order that we can reach parts of society that otherwise perhaps wouldn't listen to us, in order that we can build that societal resilience um, to the kinds of threats that they will um, encounter. And let's not forget, the most vulnerable online users are not just children, but first time users of these online platforms. And in our region, um, you know, we still have a huge development journey of connectivity to cycle through. And that means an enormous uplift in awareness uh, and training that, that we're trying to provide a part of the jigsaw puzzle to, um, but it's, it's a massive responsibility, I think, on all of us, especially as uh, we see so many new online users 
unfortunately um, being exploited in various ways. So, Marilo, you work a lot with children and children's safety and kind of basically to get rid of exploitation and child exploitation. So, how can we guarantee safety for children and also for some internet users in this interconnected world? Thank you. Yes, I work for an organization called ECPA International. We are a network of NGOs, more than 100 organizations in all regions, and our secretariat is based in Bangkok, Thailand, the global secretariat. So as you said, I will focus on the safety and the resiliency and how to build the resiliency of children. Um, the first thing I would like to, to say um, is that children have the right to be protected. And, and what, are, what is the main practical um, implication of this is that companies and all actors involved are not doing a favor to children when they are um, adopting uh, measures and standards to protect children. This is their legal obligation because children are subject to rights. This is the one aspect I would like to raise. The other one is that under the broader framework of human rights, there is a, a, a tension between um, sometimes between the right of children to be protected and the privacy of internet users. And some people, some sectors want to make it an either or debate. And I strongly believe that it doesn't have to be that way, that we can adopt a technical and non-technical measures to reconcile both. Um, and I also do believe that protecting or, or ensuring the protection, the privacy of internet users should then come at a weaker, at the cost of a weaker uh, protection of children. This is very important. And when we discuss the resiliency and how to strengthen the resiliency of children online, um, um, I think there are two aspects. And, and the first one is that we have to disting di distinguish between the type of risks. There are some risks that are triggered by the behavior of the users, in that case, by children. And the debate around this question, for me, is more about human behavior than technology. Because we're discussing here about children who are perhaps solicited 10 times a week uh, to send a pic, a sexualized pic. Um, I just heard that from uh, someone in Stockholm who did a research with teenagers in schools. That's the average number of time children, adolescents, were required to send a pic by peers. So we're discussing uh, here, how can we work with the children or the teenagers so that they can, they can resist the peer pressure? It's not so much about technology, it's about trust, their circle of, of trust. How can they um, learn to go and talk to someone from their circle of trust? But there are also the risks that are triggered by companies, uh, content providers, social media, who do not um, set up the proper standards. And whereas it, sh it should be their responsibilities and we have to look at ways how to do that, how to enforce that on those companies. And I believe Juta is gonna touch upon this topic, so I won't. I want detail on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if we are talking about the right to be protected and kind of the societal approach to it, mm. can you add something what Poland is doing in this area, Minister Sagorski? Good afternoon. Thank you very much. For in Poland, uh, we are uh, trying to to talk about the trees as a uh, as a challenge uh, because you are talking about the, the this whole problems which we mentioned here uh, we must uh, look uh, for allies who uh, will help us to meet these challenges depending on the area because uh, uh, it must be emphasized that, that it's necessary to act simultaneously on many fronts. We will have different partners, business, public administration, NGOs, but also individual citizens in the role of students, parents, pupils, teachers, uh, as well as uh, consumers, portal users. Only systematic cooperation with them will allow us to achieve the basic goal, with, uh, which is uh, network and user security. Talking about the areas where this cooperation is required is primarily the security of the network itself. 
um, it's the uh, it's the first uh, goal for us. And now, uh, very important uh, in the context of 5G. S in Poland, we we talk a lot about this um, because infrastructure is the crucial element of uh, of the system. Security of mobile web networks is becoming crucial if only because, because the use of mobile internet is becoming more common. We are talking about children, about teenagers in Poland uh, for 80% of teenagers. A smartphone is the basic, if not only channel to access the network. So we are, if we are talking about the safety uh, of, uh, of children, we must also talking about the safety of the, of the mobile uh, network. And new issues are constantly uh, emerging, such as the security and uh, rights of social media users, for example, also in the context of children. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, we should discuss about uh, who we are as a social media uh, consumers, uh, or, uh, or, mem or may maybe only member of the, um, of the community, and what are our rights. Uh, this discussion is also very important. And uh, as a public administration, we are not able to make full use of the opportunities offered by the digital revolution. So, from this reason, uh, mutual trust is so important. One thing I would like to, uh, to, to, to say from the Polish perspective, um, one example. Since September 2018 to August 2019, um, which is uh, 20, 12 uh, months uh, after Polish cyber security law, law was introduced, only one of our three searches uh, at national level received almost 22,000 reports of potential incidents. It is a 30 percentage more than a year earlier. So, what that, that does it show to us? Uh, that's uh, proof two things. There are, of course, more cyber threats, cyber crimes, and I believe there are no more people being aware. Uh, being aware of the nature of uh, types of cyber threats and being aware about how to report these incidents. It's also very important if you are talking about the safety, because if you are talking about alliance, about cooperation, we need a cooperation also from the, from the business and from the, uh, from the citizens. The increasing awareness did not come from nowhere. It's a result of activities taken by the public and private entities in recent years. Activities taken separately by public administration, businesses or NGOs, and activities resulted from close cooperation of public-private. And last thing, but uh, very crucial in the context of, uh, of the uh, aerial uh, statements. As I mentioned, there's a lot of areas where we need strong cooperation, but one of them is especially important. This is the safety of our children. So when we are talking about treats crucial, uh, which could affect children, and from this reason, one, uh, one of in the initiatives of my ministry on which we, on we, in Poland on which we put a lot of emphasis is to protect children and to use against dangerous contact available. So uh, last, um, uh, last month we uh, signed the declaration of cooperation to ensure the safety of children and use on the internet. Uh, it's uh, an example of a wide range of initiatives which we are taken by many players in Poland. So it's very important for us, concluding. We need material trust, sharing information and knowledge, cooperation, the private sector and cybersecurity. And last but not least, we're talking about the legislation, uh, the good legislation, which gives uh, enough protection of consumers and enough space for business to grow up is also very important. Thank you so much, Mr. Ko. Welcome to the panel. Um, how do you assure cooperation between the private sector and the administration and building up cyber security capacity in Singapore? Thank you very much. I'm David Ko, the head of uh, Commissioner for Cybersecurity from the Republic of Singapore. 
what we're trying to do is we are actually trying to build a digital society. Uh, my country has an aspiration to have a smart nation. Singapore is a tiny country, so it's a smart city. Uh, my country is a city, so smart nation is a smart city on steroids, if you like. So we have framed it as an issue of digital readiness. We want our people to be able to reap the full benefits, the opportunities that the digital economy gives them. So what is digital readiness? It's things like digital access, digital literacy, digital participation, and digital security. Um, digital readiness is more than just access. It's about equipping the people with the skills and the know-how of how to use technology. We are not digital natives. My children are digital natives. Uh, we are emigres. I still speak digital with a bit of an accent. Now, the Singapore government has introduced various digital literacy initiatives um, to enable Singaporeans to have the skills, the confidence, and the motivation to build, use technology beyond just being able to operate mobile devices or computers. We need to nurture a digital society which, which includes ensuring that no one is left behind especially vulnerable groups, and this I would include children, people with disabilities, seniors, and low-income families. Singapore, you might think, is a rich country, but we have people who are you know, low-income, they have less access, so how do you ensure that they're not left behind? So digital inclusion is an important uh, priority in my country. It also means access, um, which means that it has to be affordable. So again, uh, issue of uh, affordability comes in, and also language. Not everyone in Singapore speaks English. A lot of the older generation did not have the benefit of education. So there is a big challenge in terms of having um, appropriate access in the vernacular in languages like Malay, Tamil, or Chinese. A uh, big challenge for government when we're trying to put out uh, applications. You know, it's difficult enough trying to have it uh, uh, usable in English, but you have to have it in four different languages. Uh, so these are real challenges. It also means security. And by this, we talk about things like cyberbullying for children. This is a big issue uh, for the younger generation. Also cybersecurity and cybercrime, and also digital literacy, literacy, being able to tell truth uh, from fiction. Uh, how are we doing this? We're doing it through a multi-stakeholder approach. We call it a 3P approach. So it's the public sector, the private sector, and the people sector. And we try to do this as an inclusive manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's a lot of building up digital readiness and citizen education. But, Yuta, is it not only the user's responsibility? Is it just maybe more than just the user who has to add to this? Of course I do think, although my organization, which is the Digital Opportunities Foundation in Germany, where I'm chairwoman of the board, has always the user in the focus, but we, are, we follow a more human rights-based approach, and I, I really appreciated hearing uh, Minister Altmaier this morning saying that uh, the internet Access to the internet is a human right, should be a human right in some parts of the world, but it, sh it should be everywhere. But we also see that there is a right uh, to protection. Uh, of course, we need user education, we need digital literacy, and I really like hearing and like seeing, especially at the Internet Governance Forum, how many initiatives are going on in the various countries. I, liked really what I heard from the uh, government representatives here on the panel. We need users uh, that are competent, that have the relevant skills to make use, to benefit from the internet, from digitization. But we also need to say that states have obligations and companies have responsibilities towards their users. There is something called the duty of care, and of course we need care of those most vulnerable groups, but we need care of all users, I would say. Um, so when, when it comes to this duty of care, that means that uh, the services need to be designed that they serve the users, that the users can benefit from what, they, what is offered to them. Um, and that's, I don't think it must be uh, in conflict with of course, companies have also a, a, a duty to make money. That's their purpose, to uh, and to to 
commercialize their services, but still with the user in the focus and especially with young users in the focus. We often see that services are designed for young users, but we more often see that young users make use of services that are not designed for them. So, and I do see there a duty of care also for, for these users. Uh, and it's not, you're absolutely right, uh, David, it's not only young users. We have less experienced users still in all parts of the world. Uh, um, and uh, we, we cannot address this only with education. We need education, but we need a joint responsibility, I would say. Uh, coming to, to the end, I would like also to, to quote on the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, where it's explicitly mentioned that there is a right to access to the media. That was 30 years ago. People were thinking about mass media like the press and like broadcasting, but today that is the internet, so there is a right to have access. There is a right to have access to information, the right to freedom of expression. So when this is all formulated very well, but not addressing like the digital world that we have today. And uh, that's now a bit of advertising that we will have a session with regard exactly to the UN Convention on the Right of the Child and the big South Europe where we've been uh, in this morning where we will discuss a general comment to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and there we will also have the voices of the youth, we will have young people there so that we can discuss a bit further how they exercise their right to be heard also in the digital world. Thank you. Teams, my apologies. Can I be a little bit disruptive here and, and expand for one minute on, on what you just said? Thank you. So about the duty of care of companies and, and one important aspect in my experience, I've seen that there is a huge divide between private sector tech company, uh, uh, service providers, uh, social media platforms that are based in the Western world and the rest of the world. Uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and perhaps uh, this is, you know, linked to different, I mean, factors. One of it could be that uh, mandatory reporting is, is not happening in many countries outside of the Western world. Also, sometimes there is a lack of understanding of how automatic tools or solutions that are available, how they basically work. And I've heard um, one ISP person telling me in a country in Southeast Asia that using photo DNA would be violating the privacy of their users, which for those of you who know um, how photo DNA works, uh, it's not simply not true. It's an automatic system. It doesn't look into content. Um, you, no human does that. And sometimes it's also um, a mindset and it's just ignoring that, you know, they have an obligation and they don't want to acknowledge that illegal content go, go through their platforms or are sitting on their platforms. So um, I, I think we shouldn't think with the, of Western mindset all the time. We should look at this issue from a more of a global perspective. Thank you. So what we heard in this panel was, or even earlier this morning, that access to the internet could be a, or should be a human right, but still um, there is the right to protection, especially for the most vulnerable um, people out there, especially children. So how can we build a legal framework which is as connected as the internet is and not just national legislation? So. It has an aspect of education for sure, but at the other hand, we have kind of a duty of care by the large platforms out there, and we have to understand it as a joint responsibility. And we have to develop a global responsibility out of it, and for this we have to develop a kind of common understanding, looking at the different approaches on privacy, on security. Closing with that, we have a little time left for question, and I would like to open. Um, so are there any questions from the audience? There's one question. Just, ah, perfect. Hello, everybody. Um, from Mexico, Mauricio Hernandez. Um, my question is, uh, I have heard about the responsibility 
of uh, platforms, responsibility of uh, users and uh, human rights about um, the right to be protected as well as the right to access to internet. However, how in, this, uh, um, in all these uh, relations uh, are uh, based the, the responsibility of the states, not only in creating the, um, the correct legislation, but also to uh, include this aspect uh, within the education systems. Thank you. Can I? Piven? Sorry. Um, I, I, I actually think that, that there's, a, there's a couple of different answers to that. And one of the things that has slightly frustrated me, including amongst myself, is we haven't talked about liability. We've let this question of safety and security go for about 30 minutes without saying that we have a global system where the platforms do not accept liability for what goes on. And I think until we tackle that as an international community, we will never be safe, uh, users of all kinds. So I just want to put that out there. Also, uh, I did not introduce myself, but uh, amongst other things, I am a member of the House of Lords and we have brought in various pieces of legislation because this is something that we're looking at very carefully, specifically data protection laws and, and building on that because there is the engine room. I think rights laws, as has been described uh, very well by Utah, is a, is, a, is a really important thing. But more, more fundamentally is I think we have to stop thinking about this as an exceptional space and be prepared to apply and enforce the laws we have, whether they're health and safety, whether they're consumer, uh, you know, whether they're business laws. And I want to finish with this, which is if I put up a, uh, a, a video of a children's birthday party and it's playing Prince in the background, I get a takedown notice very quickly because of the IP laws. Those are being <laughs> properly enforced. But in your world, we're not getting it taken down quickly enough. So I think you have to look at where the power is, where the business power is, and where the accountability is. And therein lies the answer for us all. Petro, can you add to yeah, it from I'd a like, transnational... I'd like to help all of us <laughs> make a sort of mental shift that it is extremely easy to always say that it is somebody else's responsibility to do something. I know that's not what you're saying, but we are in a natural environment where basically the, the governments are saying companies are not doing what they should be doing. And then the companies say, you are asking us to do things that are disproportionate and inappropriate. And usually civil society says, you know, I don't like when you guys are behind closed doors making deals. You know, the challenge and the preliminary thing is to get the actors around the table so that they formulate the problems as a problem they have in common and not that a prob as a problem they have with each other. This is a thing that we always skip. We get into a competition of my solution is better than yours or I want to establish my solution because in a standards competition, if you are the first one to establish your standard, you will prevail and it will be a power struggle. This is exactly the legal arms race I was describing, and we need to get together to be able to formulate the problems in common before we begin to discuss the solutions. And for anybody who is interested, my advertisement is you come on Wednesday at 1.15 in the Europa Zal, where you will get more information about the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. I think I, I just wanted to pick up on, on the really good point made there about the kind of reinvention of the wheel. Um, and you see it at all different levels in, in terms of how we look at the internet, how it's governed, how states operate in the online environment, and how individuals do and businesses do. And, and I think often you hear this argument of, well, this is a new environment, therefore